2014 featuring Dr. Ken Goodman and Dr. Yeda Goodman. We welcome those of you joining us for the first time and are glad to see so many past UCRR Rep Seminar participants. Your moderators for this evening are Dr. Peggy Arbor and Dr. Dennis Otto, professors of language and literacy at Georgia State University in Atlanta, Georgia, USA, and me, Ji Hye Shin, language and literacy doctoral students at Georgia State University. We also appreciate the National Writing Project support in sponsoring these web seminars. We're joined by our GCRR research team, Tuban Guy Crowder, David Brown, Christy Pace, Adam Cho, Sarah Tomwell, and Jin Jung, all doctoral students at Georgia State University. Global conversations in literacy research consist of online interactive web seminars with the intent to circulate cutting edge research in the fields of literacy and language arts. This year, as a research project, six volunteers for our study of critical literacy professional development in online spaces. If you are interested in participating in a brief interview, please type your email address into the chat area, and a research team member will contact you within a few days to schedule an appointment. We also invite you to take our survey. The link is located on the GCRR web seminar a website. The data collected will provide important information for understanding our research regarding web seminars and their impact on international literacy discussion. During tonight's web seminar, if you have any comments or questions, please type them into the chat box. The Dr. Oda will monitor that area and the Goodman School address these at the end of their presentation. And we would love to know where you're participating from in tonight's web seminar. So please use the star tool located to the immediate left of this slide and click your location on the map. If you're having trouble locating the star tool, a picture of it is located at the bottom of this slide. Australia, that's scary cool. <laughs> Wow, it seems like we have many participants from various places, like uh, South America and then all of the world. Also, we're also interested in how many GCLR web seminars you have attended. Please use the poll button as shown in the screenshot on this slide. Please click A, B, or C. Welcome to the repeat participants and to new participants who we hope will continue to participate in GCLR, future GCLR seminars. The tonight's seminar features Dr. Ken Goodman and Dr. Geta Goodman and addresses learning to read and what teachers need to know about how reading works and how it is learned in order to be successful. Dr. Ken Goodman holds the title of Professor Emeritus, and Yeda Goodman holds the title of Regent Professor Emerita at the University of Arizona, USA. They are international scholars in the field of literacy theory, education, and policy. Grounded in psycho and social linguistic models of reading, the Goodman's work has been instrumental in the design and development of reading curricula, and especially in the area of assessment with miscue analysis. Dr. Ken Goodman has received many honors over his distinguished career, such as NCTE's David H. Brooklyn Award for Outstanding Research in English. He was elected to the Reading Hall of Fame in 1991 
Dr. Yeda Dunlan has also been widely recognized, most recently receiving Literacy Research Association's 2014 Oscar Kazi Award. She's known for popularizing the concept of keep watching, that is, encouraging teachers to be professional observers of the language and learning development of their students. The Gunmans have published widely, authoring over 25 books and 300 articles, separated and separately and together. Their most recent book, Making Sense of Learners, Making Sense of Written Language, published by Rutledge, is the selected collection of their writing. At this, at this time, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Ken Goodman and Dr. Yeda Goodman of their presentation entitled, Making Sense of Making Sense. Please join me in the giving them a virtual round of applause. Uh, we're especially excited to see people from a number of places in the world, and we welcome uh, the international participants especially, but everybody else, our friends, our colleagues, and new people that we haven't met before. Uh, we've organized the presentation today uh, in uh, around three questions, which you've already heard. I just want to introduce the questions because the questions also introduce uh, two of our grand, uh, great-grandchildren here, and you'll meet another one in a little while. Um, Ezreal is showing you uh, a letter that she wrote to her uncle uh, Noah, and she's three at that time. Uh, she's celebrating her sixth birthday already this year. And Levi is talking to all of you on his cell phone. The three questions we're going to organize around today include how do people make sense of text? And you can all watch my miscues as I make them as we, and Ken's miscues as we make them as we read through today. Although we're going to try not to read everything, uh, the reading keeps us on track in terms of time. And then we want to talk about how do people learn to read, and we'll talk about literacy development. And then we'll talk more about uh, what we think teachers need to know and focus a little, to some degree, on curriculum and where um, what we know about reading should take us into instruction. And Ken's going to take us for the first section. How do people make sense of text? Uh, obviously, we can't go into everything, but the other little exercise for you, thanks to Gary Kavar, who I think is on, online, and he said that that's a t-shirt. And if you read it a couple of times, you'll get the point. Did you read it? How many of you? Read it wrong, like the, it suggests. Look carefully at the first line. What if I told you, or is it what I have told you? OK. I put that up for a particular reason. Because we're going to talk about making sense of print. And one of the things I want you to understand is that our brains are what we read with. And the brains use a relatively uh, imperfect set of senses, eyes, ears, so that we think we're seeing every word and every letter, but the brain is very smart and only samples from the text. And you saw enough to read the first line the way it should have been written, and most of you are still puzzled by why I said that. Let me go back just a minute to show you again. What if I told you or what I if told you? When I read that, I knew there was something wrong, but I thought the eye had been left out, yet it had to show me to believe it. OK, so I'm going to talk about five ideas. It has nothing to do with the National Reading Panel having five big ideas, but these are different ideas. Reading is a process by which the brain constructs meaning. And constructs meaning is really a fancy synonym for making sense. We make sense, we construct meaning. It's a process. The brain isn't simply reading words and then getting the meaning from the text. It's constructing meaning. The eyes are the tools the brain uses. A Paul Kohler some years ago wrote an article called Reading is Only Incidentally Visual. Any 
Matrix with her oral written is a complex system of abstract symbols. And the, what we've learned from studying reading is that uh, the brain has, the, the human beings have the remarkable ability to think symbolically, the way symbols represent things and ideas, and manipulate them through that. Readers make sense of text, in other words. So to make sense of what you read, the reader must bring meaning to the text. Making sense of written language is not different than making sense of oral language. We'll talk some more about that. And how well anybody reads depends on two things. How effective they are, that is, how good they are at making sense, but how efficient they are, which means how they get there with the least amount of effort and input. I just want to, uh, before we go on, I just want to point out, we won't talk about all the books that we've put here so that you can, you can take them down as you go along. But we've discovered over a number of different, uh, over a number of years now, that the Ken Goodman book on reading is really quite accessible to a wide range of um, readers. Uh, we have a literacy group, adult literacy group, where this book has been um, read by the volunteers uh, who are doing uh, the the tutoring, and they have found the book helpful, and undergraduate students have found this book useful as well. well I want to give you a couple of little exercises, because one of the things that we've been learning is that the more we understand about the, the reading, the more we understand about the brain. And I want you to think of yourself as being on a freeway with cars all around you traveling at 70 miles an hour. And what your brain is doing as you control that car and the people around you are controlling theirs. So I'm going to have this little dialogue. Driving is a speed lane, but my exit and the freeway is coming up. Cortex to foot. The cortex occurs is where we do our thinking. Steady on the accelerator, but you're ready to change lanes. Cortex to eyes, eyes to cortex, back and forth. Check the mirrors for a break in traffic, start turning the wheel. Whoa, where did that guy come from? Nice recovery, feet and hands. So there's no looping thing. That's now, the LA freeway, especially. <laughs> now, think of reading as the same kind of thing, except we're reading at the speed of thought here, which is much faster than I'm talking in your process of my speech now. So the cortex sends message to the hands to turn the page. Eyes initiate reading, making predictions, direct eyes to confirm prediction, click few hundred thousand. Fixation is only a few hundredths of a second. Uh, the eyes are giving us information, tag size, you got a hunch of the pattern, and making predictions. I'm wording the, the text as I read it. Skip ahead now, pretty sure I didn't read them. Got the image, yeah, that's it, understood. Whoa, wait a minute, there's something unexpected. Well, I was going back and read Let's get some, oh, I didn't need that. I figured it out already. I understand that, but let's proceed with caution. Now, what I'm saying is that it's a continuous process. And the cortex, which is where we do our thinking, is always in charge. And the looping is going back and forth. And we know that there's more information going from the cortex to the eyes than there is the other way around. We're not prisoners of our eyes. We use our eyes. And there's a very big difference between vision and perception. Perception is what we think we see. Vision is what we actually see. And that's why in that little demonstration at the beginning of the talking sessions, I just continued to OK. But let's talk a minute now about the text, because readers have the feeling that they get meaning from the text. In fact, English teachers, literature teachers, had been teaching for a long time that you're supposed to get the author's meaning, and the meaning is in the text. But a text is a language unit that can express meaning in some context. It's always embedded in some social transaction, learning or informing or describing. Seeing a text in relationship to the social interaction is what gives it meaning. But the text can be as short as the parking or yield or as long as a novel or Downton Abbey. One of the things that I, as I keep, as I'm listening to Ken, I uh, keep thinking that I hope you realize that the, we haven't been using words or letters or sounds because the text includes language itself and language includes all those units constantly interacting. They don't exist by themselves and they aren't meaning making 
or language when they're isolated. When you're in a transact with the text, you think you're getting meaning from it, but all there is on the page is ink, or in the case of what you're looking at, simulated ink on a computer display. So there's a conundrum here. How can a text be meaningful if there's no meaning in the print that's there? The answer is that the meaning is not in the text. The reader is in the head of the writer who used language, sometimes well, sometimes not so well. Uh, when we think of a great writer, they're very good at representing meaning. And the reader makes sense of the text if the writer and the reader share control of the writing system. And if they vary a little bit, there's going to be differences. Where's the meaning? It's not in the text. It's in the writer and the reader. The text only has the potential to be understood. Okay. Um, written language is a continuum with oral language. And one of the things that I, I especially want us to think about is when we work, when we think about young children, is that we have stopped building on oral language when it comes to early literacy. We've been focusing so much on teaching written words and letters that we've forgotten that the connection and the building from uh, oral to, to written language is, is very important. Um, and language is continuously being invented. The connections between uh, written and oral language is being invented. It's be, uh, it's, um, written language has been borrowed and adapted from nearby cultures. Uh, the material that we're talking about, uh, and we've been using MISTU analysis mostly for the research that we use to understand the processes we've been uh, uh, sharing it with you. And that has been done in many languages, and we see this process as a universal one. Oral language multiplied human intelligence, while written language multiplies human memory. But the two of them are always interacting and transacting in the real world as we live in a social uh, social communities. In the past, in the, in the past, the uses of oral and written language were, more, were were very different, and we now think that 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 difference seems to be fading. Digital literacy has made oral and written language functions overlap more than before. We can record speech. We can uh, access it in various ways. Uh, we can represent the word chat is interesting because you can chat on, on your phone or on the internet without talking. Uh, so that these overlap. What's most important is that children, before they come to school, are already learning to read and write through their digital devices. We wanted to show you a, a little bit of um, more recent work, work being done with MISQ analysis. Hey, Eric Wilson, who's online, I understand. And um, this, but we, our original research for many, many years were done with MISQ analysis, where we had children reading orally, or readers at all ages, actually, reading orally. Um, and then um, we uh, analyzed their miscues. We um, uh, get, uh, asked them for a retelling. They got no help or uh, prompting in any way um, during their reading. More recently, we've added or expanded, thanks to Eric Colson, as Kenneth mentioned, and um, his book on uh, eye movements. If you're interested in this extension, really check that out. But the eye movement work, work has helped us realize some very important things. Here you see a, a simple eye movement marking. The uh, dots are the um, places where the uh, eye fixates. And it's only at that point when an eye fixates that information goes to the brain. When the miscues are marked separately, with you see the omission on the second line of, the, of width. You see a substitution on the fourth line of trotting for totter, uh, tottering. Um, and you'll notice that the eye and the oral language are not at the same place at the same time. This is a very complex process, and yet we're going to argue as we go along that it's simple to learn to read anyway. Did you want to uh, would you want to say anything more about the eye movement at this point? Well, what I, I want to point out is that 
There are very few fixations at the beginning of lines because the reader has made predictions there. There are a number of words that get no fixation. And there are words that get multiple fixations. Now, for instance, there is a reason why the reader regrets probably because what followed here, although you notice root gets no fixation. That doesn't mean that the brain hasn't decided what's there, but it's sampling, as you can see, and it's more or less sequential, but you see going back and forth. And of course, these look different, the eye movements look different. The, I'm sorry, the, sequ the sequence is more or less um, in order, depending on the reader. And readers that are very proficient do uh, much, don't have as uh, space, uh, oral spacing in the way um, um, other readers do. So we're, in 1908, Edmund Dewey, who was an early eye tracker who studied the reading process, had the insight to say that if we understood reading, we would understand a great deal about the human mind. I think we're at the point where we can say to Edmund Dewey, we've got many of the answers. It's no longer a mystery. And the more we understand about reading, we see that readers are doing what the mind does, that reading isn't a mental process and it's very much uh, the research is coming together in terms of understanding how reading works as a mental and process. And Edmund Huey himself was involved in eye movement uh, right. research. Yeah. Ken, did you, you wanted to mention uh, what's coming with the eye, uh, with uh, the brain. Uh, uh, well, why don't we stop and see if there's a, a okay. question that... Uh, we, we, we're going to try to stop for a short time and see if there are any clarifying questions, and then we'll uh, talk about more specific questions uh, later on. Great. I'll, I guess I'll just uh, jump in for a moment and share at least one question. I'll share one for now, and uh, when we come a little bit later in the presentation, we'll come back to at least uh, a couple more that have accumulated. Um, Peggy Seamington asks, if you would comment on how does reading on the screen or a mobile device differ from reading print text? Um, and so how, also with that, how has work on new literacies and reading changed um, your kind of perspective or your take on reading, if it in fact has? Well, they're, they're, those are two very different questions. So. The first one really is the issue of is there a difference in my answer? Uh, Ken, we're having a hard time hearing you. Would you speak up a bit? Okay, I'm sorry. Is that better? That yeah, better? that's a little better. All right. What I wanted to say was that as far as uh, I can see and as far as uh, our own research has shown, there really isn't any difference. Um, a lot of people are reading now on what looks like a book, uh, but it, uh, they're reading most of what they're reading in, in e-books and so forth. There really is a, only a single process. It, it can vary a little bit in terms of, of the context in which it happens, but it's only Well, it varies process. also if there's illustration, if there are graphs, all of the things that go on. Uh, and, and if you're going to be looking at a text on the screen, you're going to see movable um, all kinds of movable uh, materials going on the text, and the uh, brain is going to respond to all that using the eye and um, the ears too, and the mouth, and how it all works together. But um, the, the process of making sense itself, the focus on prediction, the focus on constantly monitoring, does this make sense, and what do you do about it if it doesn't, those processes uh, are going to be the same with any kind of reading in any kind of setting. Well, I want to comment on, on, I think, what I understand about the second part, because it really relates to this. The people who are saying that reading on computers and so forth is different are reacting to the fact that it seems to be so easy that little kids who haven't started school are already texting. I find it very quaint that people are making kids learn to uh, keyboard before they let them use computers when the kids are already using their thumbs very well to communicate. I think we need to understand that we've moved into an age where the overlap is so great that many, many kids all over the world are coming to school already literate. And what we need to do is accept that and build on it. Kids are, you know, the best way for teenagers 
to to hang out. You don't have to be together. They can hang out a hundred or miles or a thousand miles apart because they they can instantly communicate with each other. So I, I, it's the speeding up that we need to connect, and I think is a big difference. And that actually sort of takes us into the next question that we're going to ask. And um, before we, uh, I'm going to mention the question, and then we're going to hear a little video very quickly. But I'm going to introduce, this is a, a, another great grandbaby. Her name is Madison. Madison is three when she's reading, uh, as she's reading. And you're going to hear her reading in a minute. But I want you to watch her very carefully. Watch what she does with the book, and especially when we come to the end, which is just about a, a little over a minute, um, watch what, how she shifts her focus to the print, and then how she finishes her reading. And I hope we get this one. In a, in a sense, what Madison does for me in this little video, and hopefully for you, is to introduce the period of time before uh, kids come to school where they develop a literacy history that's, off, that's for, in, the mo in so many cases goes totally unnoticed once school starts. In fact, we don't even find out whether kids can um, open books, how they open the books, how they follow along when they're reading alone, not when they're being tested. So when they're reading on their own, what are they looking at? Where do they look? And of course, this is what I, I've uh, done so much with my kid watching, is to watch and observe very carefully. Uh, this, was, um, this picture, by the way, was taken on a cell phone, so uh, it, it was difficult to get, us, get it in here. But it, and if, I hope you noticed at the very end how um, Madison actually began to point to the print. Nobody told her to do that. Somehow at that moment, she, that became part of the attention of the text that she was uh, singing, actually. And this is a song. And she began to do this on the page where the music was written. So in some way, she responded to the difference of the, the content of the written form itself in coming to making sense out of this text for herself. So. As Ken already has uh, introduced to some degree, we need to appreciate the incredible language learning that young children are involved in from the very beginning. Actually, Without instruction. And all of us have been involved in that. We've all become language learners as a result of those years of living uh, prior to coming to school. Uh, we, the children build a control over the basic grammar of their language or their language languages. And it seems to me so ironic that in the United States especially, when a child has two languages, rather than using, indicating the power of language as multiple languages as resources and knowledge bases, we turn those things into deficits. And all of a sudden, if you're dealing with two languages, you have to be tested separately and you have to have special programs and, uh, and you have to focus more on skills. 
So the whole notion of how we value children and what they learn and how they learn becomes a very important part of understanding literacy development in any way. We actually believe that learning to uh, um, learning to uh, read should be an easier system than even learning a second language because you're learning an alter alternate semiotic system of a system that you already know. And so what we argue is that oral and written language are parallel language processes. Uh, I indicated earlier that we need to think again. Uh, we've done this over time. These are, all of these issues are issues that we've uh, talked about uh, many times in education, the power of oral language opportunities and experiences for young children, and that both for, uh, reading and writing are psycholinguistic guessing games. And that's not a metaphor. It actually is what is happening. The brain is continuously guessing, predicting ahead. Same way as you do as you drive a car. That is pretty good guessing. And there are two aspects of language that become very important in the language learning. And, in some, and sometimes in English classes, we even call these two aspects problems. But we see them as supporting meaning making. And that's ambiguity and redundancy. And I'm going to let Ken talk a little bit about that. If language were perfect, it would be very hard for us to use. We all have to speak the same way. We couldn't uh, perfect it and make it work differently for other people. Uh, but what uh, we need to understand is that Every one of us has a set for ambiguity. We can let the symbols in the language shift even within the same phrase and change their, their meaning. What makes that possible, though, is that language is overwhelmingly redundant. As soon as I know one part of a sentence, it limits what can follow that. So the redundancy and the ambiguity go together in such a way that the brain is very efficient in making sense, even though it uses only partial input. We have a very good way of constructing the world, and we fit everything into that. Language is easy to learn because that's the way the brain works. And we need to understand then that the, to the extent that the instruction matches the way the learning takes place, it's going to be easier rather than hard. And the same resources that kids have been using in their history uh, in oral language development, those same resources are used in their, as they become consciously aware of, of the importance of the written language in their world. And they need to be able to integrate the three levels or cueing systems, the relationship between um, um, the sound and the written, uh, the orthography, the grammar, the meaning. When those are taken apart, they're no longer language. And when we spend time teaching too much of that isolated material, we're teaching kids not what reading is, instead of teaching, helping them learn what reading is. Their ability to make predictions and inferences, the sampling that they have to do in order to read, and you saw some of that in, um, in Madison's reading, and there are times especially in early literacy where you begin to see them paying more attention to the print in front of them and then moving away from that. That's part of the process and it's actually part of the process all the time. And always the ability to self-correct. In oral language people have, um, have studied repair in young children, they use that term, and in this analysis we've looked continuously at self-correction and you see those self-correction processes in eye movement research as well. I, we also have a, an example here, I think, is that the next example? No. Oh, no. That's going to come later. Okay. Um, so I went back to some of my very early work that I did. After Ken got involved in his MISQ work and began to build his, the model of the reading process that he has continued to develop and, uh, over the years, I wanted to see, so what do younger children know? What do children know before they're schooling? And so I built this concept, or and actually two concepts that I'm going, I just want to mention in passing, the roots of literacy. That these roots are absolutely necessary into, in the development of literacy. Yes, and of course, the more, the, the more they're available, uh, the, 
um, the more opportunities and experiences the kids have. The other is to realize, and I have no, I absolutely believe that it's very important to read to children, uh, to read with them, to read to them, to let them read by themselves. But there are other roads to literacy that some children have that we have to also recognize and value because not all children are in contexts where they're being read to or they have lots of books. And so we have to value the other kinds of literacies that are available. Children Your confession is that neither Yana nor I were read to in we were just young children. And I don't think our parents were bad parents, right? Um, I actually had to learn to understand that my parents were literate uh, because actually um, I grew up believing because of the way teachers treated me that my parents who were Yiddish speakers were not literate at all because they didn't have the kind of school literacy that was available, or that, that schools thought were necessary, or that I learned that was necessary being part of that uh, experience. But kids play at literacy, and the power of environmental print is uh, a very important issue um, that uh, when kids are reading newspapers and, and looking at magazines and all the kinds of interactions are all giving them uh, opportunities. And I know lots of parents who tell me that they actually have to go down different streets when their babies are 18 months old because they'll scream for McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts, Dunkin' Donuts. And they, their kids are already bringing into their world the literacy that's in their environment. I want to um, just share with you one an, a, a, a miscue that was done on a child. You see how many years ago this was done. It was done as, 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 as part, part of my dissertation. And this is Franklin, who is in Carolyn Burke's classroom, for those of you who know my colleague who helped with the development of the uh, reading miscue inventory. And um, Carolyn taught this classroom that was at that time called a uh, pre-first uh, pre grade. And these are supposed to be kids who were not ready to read. And here is Franklin reading a book that he'd never seen before. And what I learned over a period of time, even after I analyzed his miscues, um, and his miscues were wonderful because they produced uh, sentences that were syntactically and ex uh, semantically acceptable. They made sense. But then I began to realize over time, as I became more sophisticated about linguistics, that these, many of these sentences that have the word toy in them are really unacceptable grammatical sentences. In English, we don't talk about specific things by using generic terms. And that's what Franklin was telling us. He wanted those generic terms. And he had some help with those generic terms because there was a picture on the opposite page that showed um, but, uh, different toys. But he had to make decisions here to decide which ones does he use when and how do they fit in the language. And he does that quite well. And at the same time, while we're looking at miscues, we thought we would show you a, um, uh, to, to talk about the universality of the process. This is a miscue that was uh, done in uh, Xiaomei Wang's work, where she uh, is teaching Chinese to, uh, grad, uh, to undergraduate students. And she uh, uses miscue analysis with them to help them understand what their miscues are about. And she encourages them to read the English word for themselves if they don't know what the Chinese word or and can't pronounce it. So that they are using the resources of both of their languages as they're um, reading orally anyway. And we see uh, that they're making miscues, they're doing, uh, they're going back over and repeating words. And in the first, and the first one on the second line, they, uh, the, uh, the reader actually read the appropriate, uh, read what was in the text, and then decided to say river god and sabed because uh, that didn't fit the sense making that this reader was doing. There are two omissions in this line. Two omissions in the line. And now we're going to move to the third question and think about how do we take this information that, uh, and, and how do we help teachers understand this or, and, and learn this? And I 
as I say this, I know that there are many teachers in this audience that know this information very, very well. Because teachers who themselves are engaged in kid watching and miscue analysis learn the process of the reading from their own uh, analysis of miscue analysis. And, I, and I've begun to think of miscue analysis as a liberating tool because it liberates us to understand the process for ourselves. And we've been using uh, miscue analysis with students. I just spent a semester working with an eight-year-old who has been struggling, helping him understand the reading process. Actually, um, Kelly uh, Allen, one of our graduate students, uh, have, is working much more closely with him than I am. But we've been working together and helping uh, Wyatt understand his own reading process and the power that miscues show about what he knows, not what he doesn't know. Ken and I are going to um, say, uh, talk about a proposition that we're beginning to explore with others. And that is, why do we teach reading and writing as, a, um, as courses in elementary school especially? Why aren't we doing what Alan that you saw on the previous slide, Alan Koshawa's um, uh, uh, students, who are engaged in learning experiences. That's the center of the curriculum. The curriculum shouldn't have a course in reading or writing or spelling. We should be engaging kids in learning experiences through topics and units and whatever kinds of things. And then reading and writing are the tools that we help, the teachers help kids use in order to expand on their information, in order to find information, in order to write about what they're learning and what they're reading, and to connect with all kinds of people in order for learning to read to expand and develop. It's interesting that everybody's commenting on the fact that cursive writing is virtually disappearing. It's disappearing certainly among adolescents because it's, it's uh, no longer needed. They don't do much of their writing uh, with pens and pencils. They do it on computers. And uh, texting has developed its own kind of way of communicating uh, with shortcuts because you're using your thumbs. And we have to understand that we had turned a sequence of skills that was arbitrary into reading and writing rather than involving kids in using it. You know, we forgot the clarifying yes, question. And Dennis, did you want to? Did you have a clarifying question at this point? Actually, yeah, I, I have one that uh, kind of a quick one. Uh, there's there's a lot of discussion being generated, and we'll get a chance to come back to many of these questions. But a quick one is: Could uh, I think uh, W. M. Drake asks? Can you define environmental print? You mentioned that concept, and it might be uh, uh, worthwhile to maybe expand a bit on it. Well, mostly, I became aware of environmental print when I uh, began to take kids on, on walks, little three- and four-year-olds around a neighborhood, and began to ask them what they thought those things that were either in the grass or at the end of a street or on the top of the building, what was that? And to me, that's the environmental print that exists. Um, environmental print is much more um, salient for me when I go to a country that uses an orthography that's not uh, English. I go to, if I go to an Asian country, I think every, every building is a Chinese uh, restaurant. I can remember being in Israel and looking at a bank and being able to spell, uh, being a, and I can sound out Hebrew, I don't read it. But I found it out, and I realized that's just, oh, it must be a real bank in Hebrew. Imagine that. We thought it was a synagogue. Uh, yeah, I thought it was a synagogue. But the, the point is that print itself, wherever it is, is part of the literacy process. That's what makes us a, a literate society. And when you begin to study all kinds of print uh, at, um, in, in whatever forms they take, whether they're in connected discourse, whether they're in uh, print uh, in the environment. And, and that's what I talk about, printing in the environment. What a, a wonderful study that um, one, of my, uh, one of the teachers in one of the schools in Tucson did was take her kids on a walk to the neighborhood to look for environmental print. And the kids found out, these are Hispanic kids in, in central, uh, in inner city Tucson, 
uh, they discovered that Spanish was being used on storefronts written in, by handwriting. But the big signs, the important signs, the street signs, were actually um, used in English. And they, these kids actually got to the point where they were able to get the bulletin board company to put a bulletin board up in Spanish that said, read to your children every day. The only signs that were in the environment in Spanish were the deer and the tobacco ads. So they used this for a critical literacy study, actually, um, and, and used the environmental print and began to understand how that affected the uh, uh, cultural issues of a society. And so uh, we'll come back to curriculum for a short time before we come to the end of our presentation. One of the concepts that Ken has been, uh, when we go back and look at uh, the previous readings, Ken a long time ago wrote an article called Revaluing Readers. And through this we began to realize that revaluing is a process that helps us become aware of how humans learn language and how easy it is for them to learn language. Um, you know, we've been blaming kids for a long time for having weaknesses that keep them from learning the skills that are to teach. You know, rather than understanding that our teaching was at cross purposes, we were teaching them skills where we should have been building on the language that they already had. So we want teachers to revalue the universal ability to learn language, and we want the students to revalue themselves as readers and language learners. My work lately has been with kids who are in special programs uh, to help them become better readers. My great frustration as I work with these kids is they already know that they can't read. The young boy, Wyatt, that I just uh, talked about, when we started working with him, he said, everybody in my class knows I can't read. I'm the worst reader in the class, and everybody knows it. We actually got him, because he was doing language experience with Ellie Allen, we actually got him to admit that he might be an author, because he was writing his own stories, and Kelly was acting as scribe. But he still wouldn't accept the fact he was a reader, because he already knew that he couldn't do the things, and he so, certainly couldn't do it when he had a stop, when he had a, um, a timer on his desk that was timing how fast he could say words. Or nonsense syllables. So how we, so to, so how we revalue, putting our effort in revaluing the relationship uh, between teaching and learning, the power of the teacher to support a child or a learner, and this can be at any uh, age, support readers as they begin to explore new areas. And what we want to uh, suggest, besides the fact that we should stop teaching reading and writing in elementary school and middle schools and teach subject matter or disciplinary issues, but we want to say that instead of using the concept of response to instruction, we should say that effective instruction is response to learning. It's that it, comes, it brings that kid watching in, but it also suggests that there is no skill, we have there, no researcher has ever developed any research that shows that there's a specific sequence that one thing has to come before the other in learning written language. It has to all be there, and that's why it's easy to learn. And that's why we go back to uh, Michael Halliday's important concept that whenever we use language, we learn it. Whenever we learn, use language, we learn about language. We become meta, metacognitive uh, in relationship to language and metalinguistic. And whenever we le use language, we're learning and expanding through language itself. The old notion that first you read to learn and then you learn to read is wrong. You learn to read in the process of reading. And if anything ever proved John Dewey's notion that you learn by doing, it's certainly language learning. And the two terms that I would like us to learn to expunge from our early literacy vocabulary are the concept that first you learn to read and then you read to learn. Got to get rid of that because it's wrong. And the second is readiness. There is no readiness for reading. There's only using literacy authentically in our culture for purposes of learning. 
I want to talk about this cruel paradox. We were in uh, Soweto in South Africa, and the children in the receiving room sang the national anthem in four languages. But people are promoting a program that serves to keep in Are you hearing me? OK, you hearing me? There? What's happening? All right. When I, I'm trying to yes, say, everyone is saying yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is that we have this paradox. Children are coming to school, many of them already literate. Some of them have learned two or three or four languages. And then we treat them as non-learners. Uh, our great grandchild, the one that you saw holding up the story that she written for her Uncle Noah is in what I call a sweatshop kindergarten. It's all day. She sits at a desk. She has worksheets to do. The other day she came home and, was, and said in kindergarten that she was supposed to know what a noun is. Uh, why I'm not quite sure. And she knew it was a thing. It was a thing, yeah. Now she's an older five. She just, in fact, turned six. But there are kids almost a year younger than her in this situation. It sets up a complex between but it's a baseless contextualized skill instruction that kids can't do by quiet and the ability that they have to learn easily. A national conference on teaching quality is an attempt to lock teachers in teacher education programs into that. So what we are encouraging for professionals, what we need to help, we need to be part of the process to help professional teachers reclaim their classrooms. I, this is not a good time to even say that, I guess, because of all the pressure. But that has to happen. They need to use their knowledge and experience to respond to learning, to develop and negotiate curriculum with their students. And very quickly, the, um, the reading and writing, um, I think that we've uh, talked quite a bit about this, but what I, I just want to mention that success comes from responding to what learners know and do, and being very knowledgeable about the funds of knowledge in the classroom. I want to, I, uh, Louise Moll has a new book on Vygotsky, L.S. Vygotsky in Education that I recommend where they talk about how um, young um, bilingual kids use the funds of knowledge uh, in their classroom and in their community to develop curriculum, to develop all kinds of materials. Our goal is to expand on what they already know and are doing. And um, we, we, the focus, you know, uh, the focus could should be on what aspects of the curriculum do the kids have questions about? How do we take uh, bring together the science, the social sciences, the physical sciences, and do the kinds of negotiation with students to do critical discussions and studies about um, based on the students and the teachers' questions using the community. Uh, bringing teachers together for study groups. Every teacher is, of course, a teacher of reading and writing because we're helping kids to use the processes as, as they learn. We've uh, been going over a lot of our old writing for a, a book that was recently published. And the other found this quotation in, from 1987 in the third edition of Language and Food in School. The American teacher has been in danger of becoming a technician who administers a sequenced and impersonal program to passively defined learners. All teachers need to be guides, supports, and monitors of learning. They need to take back the power in their classrooms from the textbooks and the tests so they can help their pupils to expand their power to use language and to think. And I've just been reading some early material going back to the beginning of the 1900s. And there were educators at that time saying that we were testing and evaluating kids too much even at that time. We've got to come out from uh, the 100 years of imposed uh, curriculum from the outside and work with the professional teachers to develop a curriculum that honors and respects the knowledge of both the kids and the teachers and the communities. I think we're ready to talk about uh, some of the questions that people have been raising. Okay, great. Thank you very much uh, for that very informative uh, 
uh, discussion, uh, Ken and Yetta. Uh, we actually we have time for one, maybe two questions. So I'll go ahead and um, pose a couple questions that came up during the during your talk. Um, one of them came rather early on from Sarah Kate Stevens. She says, "I'm a secondary teacher." And I'm curious about re what recommendations you have for children who've gotten that far without really having any ability to read or understand text. I don't think there are such children, to be honest. Let's see, I am with no respect, disrespect, but I think the, the people it, that look like that have been so crippled by instruction that is counterproductive. We keep digging and digging and digging holes under them. Uh, I'm hearing of schools where Gibbles is being used in fourth and fifth and sixth grade, uh, which is totally absurd. Uh, what we need to do is to find out what the kids are interested in and start there, move back. Uh, it, it's a strange thing when, when uh, you have a child who's, who's like that and you sit down with them. And after you get over there, the scars that are there, you begin to discover that the literacy is there. But they're so convinced that what they do is wrong that they keep trying to do the right thing. Uh, we had a, a, a friend and, and uh, former students who developed the notion of instruction dependence. Personalities. Personalities. Is where the kids are so busy trying to do what they're taught to do that they can't do what's natural for them. And when they get to the secondary classrooms, they begin to believe that there is only one right answer. And they keep trying to figure out what that answer is rather than reading and make, making sense is making sense for self, not making sense for, another, for somebody else, for other kids or other teachers. Um, I, I follow uh, the listservs, and you, uh, you might want to look at some of the listservs that the National Council of Teachers of English has. I've seen a number of very interesting discussions about how you get kids involved in thinking about texts. What surprises me is that we're still teaching one book too much, I think, in secondary classrooms. If you select, select what, if kids don't have opportunity to choose a text that's meaningful for themselves, how do they ever know that reading is for themselves? That's the first step for me, is how do you engage kids in believing that the written, that the written language is for them, that the, the reading in English classes is for them. I think that we have to provide more opportunity for kids to explore this range of literacy that's available using books that aren't just popular to all the kids. Not everybody's going to like Hunger Games. As a teacher, how disappointed I was to find out that not all my kids love Charlotte's Web. You know, if we have to find our, we're living in a society where the development of children's books and books for adolescents, thousands and thousands are published a year, new ones, and we're still focusing on single novels for a whole class or four or five novels for a semester. How do we engage kids in multiple texts? How do we build around themes so that kids can read maybe two texts or one text in groups, selecting texts for themselves? These are places to start. I'm not saying that you do away with all the single texts, because I know that uh, teachers have favorites that they think are very important. But I think that that's one area that they have to, we have to begin to look at. I hate Silas Marner because I was forced to read it. We wanted to have another question. Another question. Is there time? Ashley, um, I think that that is time. Unfortunately, we had some uh, great questions. It would have been great to get to them. But um, I'm going to hand you off and say thanks again and let our uh, moderator uh, give our final greetings. Thanks. Uh, hey, we can't hear we can't hear you. Can you go ahead? Did you I'm sorry? Oh. can you go ahead and uh, present the last slides?
it, it looks as if Jihei's uh, microphone isn't working. So what this is Peggy Elvers, and I would really like to thank everybody for joining us for tonight's seminar. Thank you, Dr. Ken and Yetta Goodman. We are really very happy to have hosted you tonight. It was a wonderful presentation. If all of us can give them a virtual round of applause. We'd like to thank everybody for joining us in this, this uh, web seminar. And if you would be so kind as to write one thought in the chat area that you found particularly poignant or interesting for the Goodmans, we'd like to share that with them. They have asked us to um, send them the questions in all the chats so that if there's anyone who has any further questions, they would be happy to respond to them on email. If anyone is interested in participating in one of our in our, uh, sorry, I'm not sure who's using, <laughs> moving the slides. But if is there anybody who is interested in participating in a 15-minute online interview as part of our research project, please type your name and email address into the chat box, and one of our GCLR research team will get back to you. And uh, we want to just mention that we have three more wonderful presenters coming up this spring. Dr. Ryuko Kubota from University of British Columbia, who will talk about race and language. Catherine Beavis from Queensland, Australia, who will be talking about video gaming and living in a digital world. And Dr. Brian Street from King's College London, who will be talking about his letter project and his teacher professional development in Africa. We really thank all of you for coming, and we hope you will continue to support Global Conversations in Literacy Research and share this link and this webinar, seminar project with everyone whom you know. Add it to your syllabus. And we look forward to seeing all of you at Ryoko Kubota's uh, presentation on February 23rd. Thanks very much, everyone, and good night. <laughs>